Hi, I'm Dr. David Tan. Did you know that almost 10 years ago, leaders from across the country were calling for the removal of intubation from the paramedic scope of practice? Why? Because a major pre-hospital airway study, very well done, showed that up to 25% of field intubations were unrecognized in the esophagus, unrecognized. Of course, this was unacceptable. That error rate dropped to 0% in services that used entidocapnography. Of course, now we do mostly associate ETCO2 with the intubated patient, but we are beginning to value ETCO2 as a very versatile tool that when used appropriately can help diagnose different pulmonary diseases, measure the effectiveness of therapy, especially bronchodilator therapy, and even serve as a guide during resuscitative processes like cardiac arrest. Entitled CO2 is no longer just something neat for EMS systems to have. It is a standard of care in pre-hospital medicine. Hi ma'am, did you call an ambulance today? Yes, I did. Okay, can you tell me what's going on? I can't breathe. And when did this start? About 10 minutes ago. And what were you doing when you noticed that you were having some difficulty breathing? Walking. Okay, do you have any past medical history? No. No? No, um, no problems with your lungs? No. No problems with your heart? No. Okay. Yeah, it's gonna go in your nose. Ma'am, do you take any medications? Dilantin. Okay, do you take that for seizures? Seizures, yes. Okay. Do you think you had a seizure this morning? I don't know. Okay. She's standing at 96%. I'll get some more vitals. Ma'am, do you feel like that oxygen's helping you at all? No. Is leaning forward like this helping? No. So it hasn't gotten any better since we've been no. here? Have you ever felt like this before? No. And you haven't had any respiratory issues before? I've had no? upper respiratory infections before. Upper respiratory? Yes. Okay. And, and how recent was that? About six months ago. And have you had any problems since? No. No? We need to go ahead and get her in the back of the ambulance. Can you go get the stretcher? Sure. Okay. Ma'am, uh, we're going to go ahead and get you in the back of the ambulance and take a better look at you. Maybe okay. get a 12 lead. Okay. Okay. Yeah. How are you feeling? I don't feel good. Okay. Uh, ma'am? Ma'am? Robert! Hello. My name is Jim Farmer and I am a paramedic and an instructor at American Medical Response. And I'm here to talk to you today about pulse oximetry and capnography. When air enters the nasal pharynx, nasal hair serves as the first line filters. Small body structures line the nasal floor called turbinates. These function to increase the process of filtration, humidify, and warm the air. From there, air goes into the posterior pharynx and the trachea. The epiglottis is a leaf-like structure responsible for closing over the trachea when a person swallows, preventing aspiration into the airway. The epiglottis, along with the vallecula, the notch at the base of the tongue, together form the laryngeopharynx. Structures of the lower airway include the trachea, the right and left main stem bronchus, and the lung tissue, of which there are two lobes on the left and three lobes on the right. Alveoli form the ends of the bronchial tree and they contain grape-like structures that are kept open by a fluid called surfactant. It is at the alveoli that gas exchange occurs through diffusion of oxygen into the bloodstream and carbon dioxide is diffused from the bloodstream and expelled into the outside air as waste. Ventilation is simply the mechanical process of bringing air in and expelling it out by contracting the diaphragm and then relaxing it. Ventilation does not equal perfusion. Oxygenation is different than mechanical ventilation. Through oxygenation, gas in the form of oxygen is brought into the lungs, diffused across the alveoli into the nets of capillaries that surround them. It is this process in reverse for carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is expelled as a byproduct of cellular metabolism. 
both oxygen and CO2 have to maintain a balance or homeostasis. Those levels of homeostasis are expressed in terms of partial pressure of oxygen, PaO2, which is 80 to 100 torr, and partial pressure of carbon dioxide, PaCO2, which is 35 to 45 torr. Oxygen and glucose enter into the cell to provide the fuel for cellular metabolism. Once this energy is used in the form of adenosine triphosphate, it is broken down into carbon dioxide and released into the bloodstream as waste products. This is otherwise known as the Krebs cycle. Did you get all that? If not, let me show you another way to understand it. All right, let's just make this simple. Let's suppose I'm an alveoli and this guy right here is a red blood cell. We're going to go ahead and exchange our gases. And while he takes that off to go perfuse the rest of the tissues with his little oxygen thing, I'm going to go ahead and blow off this CO2. And therefore, we maintain a little bit of homeostasis. The pulse ox is a non-invasive device for measuring the approximate amount of hemoglobin saturated with oxygen. Typical devices can also calculate a pulse rate over 5 to 20 seconds and are then averaged. The pulse ox itself has two lights at different frequencies that are beamed into the patient's skin. One is a red beam measuring the oxygen attached onto the hemoglobin. The other is an infrared beam that measures deoxygenated blood. By comparing the two beams, the pulse ox registers an approximate amount of oxygen in the blood. You must exercise caution. Unless your patient lives permanently in Antarctica and their skin color is blue, you must perform a thorough patient assessment in addition to monitoring the pulse ox. Normal pulse ox is approximately 96 to 100 percent. Slight hypoxia with associated signs and symptoms is 92 to 95 percent. Moderate hypoxia is 89 to 92 percent, also with associated signs and symptoms. And severe hypoxia is anything below 86 percent. The pulse ox does have a few limitations. One of the biggest is when tissues are saturated with carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide will bind hemoglobin more readily than oxygen will. Once this occurs, however, CO will mimic oxygen at least as far as the pulse ox is concerned. Therefore, your patient unable to utilize carbon monoxide the same as oxygen can saturate very high and yet be extremely hypoxic and unstable. Patients that are in shock, hemorrhaging, have a low hematocrit, will also show an altered saturation percentage, either high or low, depending upon their issue. It's for this reason, it is never appropriate to rely solely on the pulse ox as an indication of your patient's perfusion status, but rather it's a combined effort of the pulse ox, level of consciousness, skin signs, and vital signs. Waveform captainography is extremely important to the paramedic. Much more important than the actual millimeters of mercury of CO2 represented by the numbers on the monitor between 35 and 45. To not follow the waveform and not trends can be as crucial as taking a heart rate but not actually performing an EKG. As we see in the normal capnogram, the A and B represent the baseline, otherwise known as the end of inspiration. The sharp upstroke between B and C represents the first part of the CO2 passing the sensor during expiration. As we reach the plateau phase between C and D, this is the richest CO2 coming from the alveoli. The D point represents when our patient's expiration is complete and our inspiration begins. The waveform returns rapidly to baseline as CO2 is passing the sensor. A sudden loss of end tidal CO2 with a normal waveform preceding it, the paramedic should immediately assess for an obstructed or a kinked tube, esophageal intubation, or other obstruction. It's important to note that assessing for lung sounds should still be completed after intubation 
since the end tidal CO2 cannot determine a right main stem innovation. Paramedics who utilize capnography during cardiac arrests with cardiac compressions continuing while they intubate may see CPR oscillations on the monitor screen immediately upon intubating, replaced by larger waveforms once the AMBU bag has been attached and ventilations begun. The oscillations provide proof that compressions alone can produce some ventilations. Monitoring end tidal CO2 measures cardiac output. Thus, monitoring end tidal CO2 is a good way to measure the effectiveness of CPR. It's for this reason that rescuers should switch compressors every two minutes. Set the monitor up so that compressors can view the end tidal CO2 readings as well as the ECG waveform generated by their compressions. Encourage them to keep the end tidal CO2 number up as high as possible. And tidal CO2 monitoring on non-innovated patients is an excellent way to assess the severity of asthma or COPD and the effectiveness of treatment. Bronchospasm will produce a characteristic shark fin waveform as the patient has to struggle to exhale, creating a sloping B to C upstroke. The shape is caused by an uneven alveolar emptying. Asthma values change with severity. With mild asthma, the CO2 will drop below 35 as the patient hyperventilates to compensate. As the asthma worsens, the CO2 levels will rise to normal. When the asthma becomes severe and the patient is beginning to tire and has little air movement, the CO2 numbers will rise to dangerous levels, and typically that's above 60. In wheezing patients with CHF, the waveform should be upright and fairly normal. This can help assist your clinical judgment when attempting to differentiate between obstructive airway wheezing such as COPD and that of CHF important due to the completely different treatment modalities. When we have a capnography with a cleft in the alveolar plateau or right at the top of the capnogram, this is going to be a partial recovery from a neuromuscular blockade or a twitching of the diaphragm as that's pulling fresh gas past the sampling tube. In essence, your patient is starting to breathe spontaneously on their own. A camel hump capnogram, that is going to indicate that your endotracheal tube is actually too far down and it's against the carina or where your bronchus uh, separates and goes down into your right and left main stem bronchus. Hyperventilation can be caused by many factors from anxiety to bronchospasm to pulmonary embolus. Other reasons CO2 may be low, cardiac arrest, decreased cardiac output, hypotension, cold, and severe pulmonary edema. When a person hypoventilates, their CO2 goes up. Hypoventilation can be caused by altered mental status, such as overdose, sedation, intoxication, some postictal states, head trauma, stroke, or other tiring CHF patients. Other reasons CO2 might be high include increased cardiac output with increased breathing, fever, sepsis, pain, severe difficulty breathing, and depressed respirations. A decreasing waveform, but otherwise normal morphology, should put the paramedic on high alert. This is a clear-cut sign of decreased cardiac output, and a pulse should immediately be assessed. Hyperthermia and metabolism are increased in fever, which may cause the end tidal CO2 to rise. Observing this phenomenon can be life-saving in patients with malignant hyperthermia, which is a rare side effect of RSI or rapid sequence intubation. These tips should give you a basic understanding of why it is so critical for us to use end tidal CO2 in the field and how it can directly improve patient's outcome. So we've talked about a couple of differences between the pulse oximetry and actual waveform on the capnography. Now let's talk about some signs and symptoms of COPD and asthma that we can use the capnography for. Recall that the COPD and asthma is going to have a sloping or shark fin capnography. 
This is going to be true with our gro chronic bronchitis patients or blue bloaters because of the fact that they're going to be typically overweight, they're going to be mildly cyanotic. With your emphysema patient or pink puffers, the reverse is going to be kind of true because of the fact that they're going to be very thin but with a barrel chest. All of these patients are going to be struggling to exhale. So with the treatment for COPD and asthma, we're going to take oxygen and we're going to titrate that to effect right around 92 to 95 percent on your pulse ox. We're going to go ahead and administer albuterol at 2.5 milligrams and 3 cc's of normal saline, nebulized. Then we're going to go ahead and administer a corticosteroid in the form of solumedrol at 125 milligrams IV or decadron 10 milligrams IV. We can go ahead and also give epinephrine with a 1 to 1,000 concentration at 0 0.3 milligrams IM or sub-Q. And then we can also consider contacting medical control for administration of mag sulfate for 1 to 2 grams IV over 10 minutes. The mag sulfate will actually have the result of relaxing the bronchioles. When we translate over from COPD to CHF, our signs and symptoms with CHF is going to be a normal capnogram. Normal capnogram for CHF versus the sloping shark fin for COPD ears. Our signs and symptoms there with CHF is going to be rails, jugular vein distension, peripheral edema, signs and symptoms of shock, and other abnormalities. Treatment for CHF includes oxygen, again titrated to 95 to 92 to 95 percent, Aspirin at 324 milligrams, nitroglycerin at 0 0.4 milligrams sub sublingual if the blood pressure remains above 100. We can also repeat that dose. And then nitroglycerin with the one inch pace topical directly over the chest. When we go past that, we can talk about some other abnormalities with the waveform capnography, such as a decreasing waveform. That should put the paramedic on another high alert. This is going to be an indication of decreased cardiac output. The paramedic must check a pulse. Other end tidal CO2 issues include ventilating patients with head trauma. The hyperventilation may cause decreased cerebral blood flow and ischemia. Our patients with diabetic ketoacidosis will hyperventilate in order to uh, attempt to lessen their acidosis. Therefore, the end tidal CO2 will go down. Patients with pulmonary embolus, this will cause an increase in the dead space in the lungs resulting in a decrease in the alveoli available to get rid of the CO2. Again, our end tidal CO2 will go down. In cases of hypothermia, metabolism is high, so end tidal CO2 will increase. Again, hyperthermia. For a crashing intubated patient, a good thing for the paramedic to remember is dope. Remember to check for dislodgement, check for an obstruction, check for a pneumothorax, and finally a check for equipment failure. Now let's put that all together. With uh, pulse oximetry, the patient can be in respiratory compromise and still read greater than 96 percent. It can take several minutes for the pulse ox to show a change in the patient's status even after the change has already occurred. Oximetry must be confirmed with skin signs, a pulse, and level of consciousness. Conversely, with capnography, a change in the ventilatory status, such as apnea, will be registered immediately, thus allowing the paramedic to react immediately. CO2 is expired only from the lungs, thereby making confirmation of tracheal intubation. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation and thank you for your attention.